Okay, I pushed it. Now. <laughs> <laughs> you have to do okay. the intro. Tommy, you have to do the intro. <laughs> All right, now I have to do the intro? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're the intro man. <laughs> All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome back. The Killer Bees are back in town with episode eight, and we are joined by Keelan Ballou, of course. Hi. And our delightful guest, Max Bay. Hi, and everyone. Max, I can't remember your uh, Twitter handle, um, unfortunately. It's, it's escaping me. Choice underscore fielder. There we go. I was going to do it all as one word, but I knew that it had an underscore somewhere. Um, so. Yeah, yeah, I felt like that was the right place to put it. <laughs> um, so sense. if you don't already follow him, um, let me tell you, it is like statistics porn um, for any Twitter follower out there. He has great, great data around um, not just pitching but hitting and trends and I have definitely um, enjoyed seeing your work since uh, Keelan introduced um, your stuff to me and Keelan I don't know if there's anything you want to add to it because you kind of turned me on to uh, to his handle yeah um, I don't even remember how we connected to be honest it's been a while now a few months uh, Max but I just remember yeah, I don't that remember either yeah, I just remember that I was like, hell yeah, I love stats. Just even outside of sports, I think they're interesting. I'm not that great at them, but I think they're super interesting. And I do remember yeah. somebody was talking about how stats are kind of like not that important. And, you know, there's this like kind of discourse about no stats versus, oh, you just like feel the game and like feel your way through it. And maybe stats mean something, but not that much. And I think at one point I was trying to explain like stats don't necessarily give you like a specific answer. They just maybe give you a direction. And I like tagged you into a discussion I was having with somebody. Cause I was like, help, I need someone better th at this than me. So sorry about that. And thank you. But yeah, we love your stuff. Um, it's very awesome. I appreciate it. Yeah. A, a lot of what I do is just um, procrastination projects. I have real work outside of all of this um, hobby. And what I find myself doing is spending enormous amounts of time, probably way more than I should, just thinking about baseball stuff. And I needed a, a, an outlet for that, um, that sort of suited the spontaneous nature of the shower thoughts. And tw <laughs> Twitter is like perfect for that. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's, I think probably a good, it scratches that itch in that I can, um, you know, put the things I am interested in out there, um, but it's also very short form. So I don't have to think that much about it. <laughs> so it's just kind of out there, but yeah. I, I don't remember where, where Keelan, where we uh, encountered each other either. I, no I don't remember where I encountered most people on Twitter first. It's like <laughs> follow and then they're just integrated into the feed. But anyway, I'm, I'm happy to be here. Yeah. Thank you. So I know you just said you, you know, baseball, doing stats for baseball or thinking about baseball aren't really like your full-time gig. Um, so kind of how did you get into doing baseball stats or like, how did you start thinking about that so much as your shower hobby? Yeah. Um, it's not something I've, um, it, I, I think, so I, I, um, I'm a, I'm a PhD student in neuroscience, but the, the work that I do is um, like largely examining um, like how genes are expressed. And there are these um, different uh, like statistical sort of um, approaches for understanding all of this. And um, it's funny, I didn't really like baseball all that much or pay much attention to it until much later in my life, um, until I was an adult. Uh, but when I realized how much information was public and how much research had been done, um, I took like a lot of the, um, I guess, sort of like approaches and like technical skills that I have uh, and just applied it to baseball. And it started really um, simple, would just do things like 
you know, like compute FIP from scratch, things like that. And then it just kind of grew into um, areas of research that are sort of like active areas of research in, of research in baseball. Um, and sort of a, a natural thing, like there's, there's um, a, a bunch of people who look at the enormous quantity of data and they're, they're like um, unanswered questions about baseball, but then also competing strategies. And um, I noticed is that I just sort of like found myself kind of in the thick of this research um, world. And um, now there's a, a pretty healthy community that I, I really like engaging with that, you know, um, does baseball analytics, I guess, broadly as a term. Um, but my fandom is not like just limited to that. I, I love, I just love the game. I love the suspense of it. I, I love um, the timing or timelessness of it or time freeness of it. And so I have this kind of like, you know, the, the stats side of my approach to it, but then also just the raw fandom, you know, and being yeah. from LA, like, I don't think I'm allowed to like another team. The angels aren't in LA. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Those are the rules. <laughs> it's, those are the rules. It, it is. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, I'm a rule follower. So, <laughs> so anyway, that, that's my team. And yeah, that, that's kind of my, uh, that's, that's, that's my baseball brain. <laughs> Mix cool. of raw fandom, yelling about Dodgers and a bunch of, you know. <laughs> yeah, it is, it is funny because I've noticed you will like talk stat stuff, but then every once in a while, like the Dodgers will have something happen or a decision made. And it's like, oh, there, there he is. You'll have like kind yeah. of a, a comment on Twitter <laughs> that'll be like, oh, there's the emotion. <laughs> I was like, you fan. You're like, you Austin Barnes, clutch hit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Just screaming. <laughs> um yeah. so so yeah I think you know we came even though you're you're a Dodgers fan which is fine um and we have some of that crossover <laughs> too there's like a weird Dodgers White Sox crossover like um I know two folks within our sphere uh they're married and one's a Sox fan and one's a Dodgers fan and mm -hmm. uh yeah, they took a video, the Dodgers fan um, took a video of her son twerking to uh, Yasmani <laughs> Grundle's home run a few days ago. So yeah, we've got Sweet. that that connection. You guys are good he folks. Doesn't, he doesn't twerk to the walks? No, I guess not, even though they're twerkable. Um, but I know that is one thing so. we were going to kind of ask you about today, because that is kind of like a big crossover we've had from you guys. Um, so yeah, I was hoping you'd be able to Tell us what you think about Yes, our, our walking king. <laughs> walking king. Yeah. Uh, what do I think about the walking king? <laughs> um, well, he wasn't always king. He was at least a prince, but I don't know if he ascended. And I don't think there was a coronation until this year. Um, yeah. Man, it's amazing. <laughs> Yes. He have now. He has a 28%, 28.7% walk rate in 2021. That just should not happen at this point in the year. It's like they're treating him like Barry Bonds. It's so weird. Is he Barry Bonds though? <laughs> so, I don't know. Not really, but that that was actually the comp, uh, the comp that I made is that, you know, early on in the season, it just got to the point where if he was taking a pitch, it was like the umpires were looking to see if he swung or not to determine if it was a strike. Um, right. I, he just doesn't take like nothing that, that's away from the plate. He, he just knows and he has such a good eye. Um, you know, I, I think I haven't seen so many pitchers really pitch around him the way that they have been outside of a Barry Bonds and even a lot of yeah. that was intentional walks but in this case so his okay so like let's ignore the intentional walks <laughs> just look at his zone rate yeah so how often are they throwing in the zone it's a career low but it's not that dramatically it's not that lower low. yeah it's 43.7 percent last year it was 47.8 2019 is 46 49 47, 45. It is a career low. He is getting fewer pitches in the zone. Um, but it's not so dramatic as to account for that giant boost in walk rate. But that's kind of not considering like the distribution of those 
um, the zone, you know, in zone or out zone pitches. And so I'm sure like clearly he's getting a lot of out of zone on, you know, three ball counts. And so like, that's something I just, you'd want to look at, but yeah, I, I don't know. My, I've long thought that it is probably worthwhile for certain pitchers who do not attack the zone to just go into the at bat with a no swing mentality. Like you have to sell it. You have to look like you might swing, but I think there are certain pitchers, Shane Bieber probably being a prime example that are, they're really good at tricking you. So just don't allow yourself to be tricked. Don't swing. And it almost looks like <laughs> that's what Yasmani Grandal's doing. Um, so he, it's not like he's not swinging at all, but okay. If you look at the Savant page, for instance, this is what, this is the funniest thing to me. So he has a, a pretty low whiff rate. So he, he whiffs through pitches fairly often. So if that's your issue and you're not making good contact when you, or you're not making contact when you swing, maybe it's better not to swing. So it looks like he's kind of not swinging as often. You look at his chase rate. So this doesn't tell you, you know, overall swing rate, obviously, but it does tell you, okay, generally a pitch is out of the zone. What is his uh, uh, swing rate at balls out of the zone? That's all chase rate is. It's 99th percentile. So he whiffs through balls all the time, but he's not swinging at the pitches you don't want to swing at. Um, so that's why he's 100th percentile batted ball. I'm sorry, but 100th percentile walk rate. And he has this, you know, ridiculous 28.7% walk rate. I, I don't know. I, like, it just doesn't seem sustainable to me. There's no way that it could be that high throughout the rest of the season. But you can't take away the walks he's already had um yeah right and he clearly has a good eye right he's not chasing and that is such an important skill especially when you're facing a pitcher who doesn't like to attack the zone so you know maybe he's not making great contact all the time and he's he's <laughs> you know, he has a low batting average but man is he getting on base that is crazy yeah i think that's been um and maybe you've seen some of this kind of scoot into your world just by just from our fan base. Um, but that's been kind of an, like a big thing. People are like, Oh, why does he keep doing this? And and not really treating it like a skill at all. Um, of and course it's, it's been, a skill. I mean, yeah. yeah. And it's on I mean, there's been a lot of work showing that the on-base percent is more important than many other statistics because yeah. you're on base and people can put, you know, bring you home. I mean, nobody complains about that if the, the hitters behind him are hitting. Nobody complains about that. Right. It, yeah, it and becomes that becomes an issue. Exactly. And that's the biggest thing, too, is that as, as a team, historically, the Sox have never walked very much. And a lot of the Sox hitters are free swingers that expand the strike zone all the time. So having somebody like Grandal, especially when he's in the you know, two hole or top half of the lineup, it gives a lot of opportunities for longer at bats so that the guys behind him can kind of see the arsenal that the pitcher is working with, see some of the, you know, patterns and it, it time and time again, it has always come to fruition where it's like, okay, because it was a 10 pitch at bat to Grandal, it knocks the starter out that much earlier, or it creates a situation where the hitters behind him know what's coming. Yeah. I mean, all that's important. All that's really important. Um, you wear, you wear the pitcher out. Um, and yeah, I mean, at, at the end of the day, you, you if, if you, the team is struggling as a whole to produce when there are runners on base, then the fan base tends to get sick of, of walks. And I understand that impulse. Um, cause it kind of feels like, um, you know, a late inning home run in, in a not close game. Um, it feels like great. So this person can hit, but they're not hitting at the right time. Um, but yeah, I mean, I guess you just sort of have to take a step back to the extent that you can and then recognize what talents exist on your, your favorite team and 
um, you know, I, I think it's, it's fair to be upset at other players for not producing, but you know, if this is the talent that he brings, if he, if he's bringing, getting on base, what is his on base percent? So it's uh 398, <laughs> 398 with a 155 average. That's funny. Yeah. Then it's, I mean, look, people will feel differently about this. People have enjoyed different components of the game, but if your goal is to get runs, that is an excellent way towards getting runs. And, you know, that's, that's all you can really say about that. Oh, he has a 138 Babic. Yeah. That's unfortunate. He has career high ISO. Everything about it is just like video game numbers. Like it doesn't seem plausible <laughs> for it to be a real, like you said, it's probably not sustainable, but for it to have lasted this long is pretty mind blowing. We've been saying it's not sustainable for over for a, a month now. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I think that was like, that was the original <laughs> argument. I like this argument has calmed down quite a bit now, but when it was at its most heated, that was the thing people were like, it's just not sustainable. It's like, okay, but it's what we it have is. now. And exactly. It's, yeah. yeah. And it's yeah, gone yeah, longer yeah. than we thought. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, if a player has sort of like, is going through a hitting slump, it's really, really nice to have a good on base uh, baseline, uh, so to speak, just to start from. You know, if, if, if your WRC plus is, is above 100 and you're going through a major hitting slump, that's great. You know, that means you're seeing the ball um, at least as it crosses over the plate well. Maybe you aren't making good contact at that moment. But I, I just I don't think there's any reason to believe that um, his hit tool has been completely sacked. You Absolutely. Know? Yeah. So you've got to imagine that he will hit for – better average if not great average because it was never great um continue having that power and if he could maintain this sort of plate discipline i mean you have the best catcher in baseball it's kind of simple as that and you don't even have to hit for high average if you're hitting for as much power as he is getting on bases as often as he is especially where he is in the lineup so yeah, yeah, I think that's that's been a really interesting narrative too. Is just like the, the focus on batting average um, and not kind of the other points, and that also it, comparatively with other catchers, especially, it's like uh, he's doing okay. <laughs> he's, he's doing great. I think the other thing is, you know, you, it's it's easy within a season to get very caught up um, with the trends of that season, and and unless there's good reason to think that his historical performance is no longer informative, then you have to, you have to assume that, that there will be some like upward regression um, in each of the components that you're worried about. I don't think he's this bad of a um, contact hitter. Like he's just not, he's not great, but he's not this bad either. And as soon as that gets good, every, all of the other fundamentals, are sound or much better than sound um so you know enjoy it i don't know we talked a, a, a bit there's been a bit of a max muncie comparison at this point yasmani has grandal has just he's gone way beyond what max muncie did <laughs> muncie had a, a three four week long slump where he just wasn't hitting at all but he was um taking walks kind of like Grandal was. He had like a 24% walk rate. It's pretty incredible. Then he started hitting and he maintained, well, you know, it took some of the walks away, but the walks converted to hits. So it was fine. And, you know, and then he sort of propelled himself to MVP candidate sort of echelon. And yeah, I wouldn't worry about Grandal in that respect. The thing as a Dodger fan that I always worried about with him was just exhaustion. Because yeah. he was a September, and I don't know if this is a real thing, but for him, it was just reliable. Every year in September, he got really tired. He couldn't hit at all. Um, and he had a lot of catching mistakes, a lot of pass balls. There's oh. like a Yasmani pass ball <laughs> nickname that people gave him. Uh, since he left for the Brewers and now is, that he's on the White Sox, it doesn't seem like he's had that issue i guess you didn't really get to experience that last year so we don't know 
not yeah. so much pass balls, but um, at least once a week, one or two catchers interference calls. Oh, right. Mm. And so, um, you know, and that really, it, it's more than I've seen with any catcher I, I can remember in recent history. I, I've never seen, and I get it because when you're framing, you're trying to, you know, quickly grab the ball and, and, you know, put it in a way where it looks like it's a strike. But there have been so many times where the bat has clipped the top of his glove or things along the, those lines where it's just like, yep, yeah, that's catcher's interference every time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe that's a problem. I don't know. I don't know how catcher training works with teams. You know, like, how do you teach catcher framing? How do you teach It's team these specific. Things? So every yeah. team has their own philosophy in terms of catching, um, whether it, and it, that, that goes down to even just how they situate themselves uh, behind the backstop. Every team is a little bit different on how they approach it. I think what yeah. makes the Sox more interesting than other teams is that none of the Sox catchers or outside of Grandal are very defensive oriented so it's been a lot of you know can we can we work with this can this improve um because you know it's zach collins and your mean mercedes more or less as the two other catchers that are on the team and even in the minor leagues most of the guys that are there outside of a couple are all offense first catchers and it's kind of like all right can you train them to be adequate and and how does that work and how can you get them to be better at framing and you know there have been some that have improved over time um most of them after they left the socks but there have been a lot of others that are just like they're adequate but that's about it yeah and then i think this year he had uh grundall had his knee injury too and he had to change his stance so that's going to be interesting that's the big part to of it see too. yeah yeah to see how that might affect him especially like if he still does get tired um but yeah, I, that'll be crazy to see because I can't imagine being a catcher for that long and then having to change like how. Um, but I do. T- I wonder too, like how much that has to do with him hitting and stuff too, because it seems like that conversation really dropped off. Like he came back and people forgot about that and if it might still be lingering or not. And it really hasn't been brought up that much since he's been back and playing regularly again. Yeah. You've got to imagine that, you know, you don't really know how bad it is until they have to run a lot. Um, And, you know, he's not a fast guy, um, but he never was. So it's kind of hard to evaluate, like, you know, are you pool holes level bad? (laughs) Like, how slow are you? Yes. Yes. (laughs) We saw it last night. Yeah, he definitely is now (laughs) but like is there a floor you know what i mean like at a certain point like maybe the injury doesn't really make it that much worse than you already are (laughs) yeah yeah no there's been a lot of folks joking on twitter about um how on the show he has like a speed rating it was one and now it's at zero so i guess zero i thought that was the floor but maybe we can go negatives i don't know (laughs) walking backwards (laughs) backwards so yeah these are our fascinating, fascinating guy. Do you have anything going on with the Dodgers? Oh, do I have anything going on with the Dodgers? Yes. <laughs> There's always something. Well, do I? Landis, isn't there? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have. I don't personally have anything going on with the Dodgers. I love them. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it's it's been an uh, an interesting ride as a Dodgers fan, following this uh, would be super team. It is a great team that um, went through a really miserable slump and came out of it, you know, sort of right um, on pace with the other now two primary division rivals in the Padres and the Giants. And, um, you know, I, I, I think it was a bit overstated to um, make predictions about this team having the potential to, you know, break the all-time win record. Um, You know, there's, it it had like 25% World Series win odds, which is, 
I don't know. A lot of models did show that 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 was a reasonable, you know, chance to give them. Um, and these are pretty sophisticated models, but that always just blows my mind. How you can have 25% chance. That's just, you know, you have, of course, the, the, um, the regular season to wrestle with, but then once you get to the postseason, there's just so much chaos. And, you know, even if you have like a, a, a really good chance of winning any one game, let's say you have like a great team, they have a 75% chance of winning any one game. You have to win a lot of games. <laughs> with 75% chance. And yeah, it just, uh, when you, you kind of like look at all, what it takes to um, sap a team's competitiveness, it's really not all that much, even for a, a deep team. Um, so following this team, starting the season with very, very high expectations, starting um, the first 15 games, 13 and two, it seemed like, yeah, well, maybe this, this will be the year. And then they had like a, I don't remember exactly, but like a 14 and two streak or something like that, or two and 14 streak, I should say. Um, and yeah, I, I think that it's, this is probably a good thing for the fans ultimately to not just sleepwalk through the regular season um each game does have an additional thrill to it than it did like last year uh even though it was a 60 game season they walked away with the division and they did the same thing in 2019 and it makes august and september even more grueling than they were it already is um wow what a spoiled <laughs> <Man. laughs> it's a good life to have isn't it <laughs> yeah no kidding yeah. Now that, but that's the thing. Yeah. I mean, even though like, even with that level of success uh, and I think it's funny because the the main theme that we've heard now that people have moved on from Grandal is, Oh, the Sox are doing so well. Stop complaining about Tony La Russa. Enjoy the ride. And as somebody that knows enough about Dodger baseball, I do know that Dave Roberts has been, like in this love hate relationship with the Dodgers fan base. And I didn't know if you could speak to that, especially from an analytics standpoint, how a lot of his decision making is just constantly under a microscope and, um, you know, just kind of where that fits in and the overall Dodger fandom. Yeah. Um, Dave Roberts is a fraught topic among Dodger fans. Um, the one thing nobody disputes is that the players love him and he's a, a player first manager clear clearly has, um, you know, the team on his side and is a great like diplomatic representative of his players. You know, when Kenley Jansen blows a save, even in the thick of his struggles, um, Dave will say, you know, it looked like he didn't quite have his stuff, but he's got great stuff and we, we trust him. Um, and that sort of unwavering commitment to like um, his players is, is something that, that I think every fan likes about him. Um, Absolutely. The issues always reach a fever pitch in the postseason, both because um, the postseason has higher stakes for each pitch, each decision, each game, of course. Um, but then also because he made some stupid decisions that um, are, are very perplexing. And he, he, during the regular season, has a reputation for um, making what seemed to be very um, dry, analytically driven decisions, big, big picture decisions where, you know, he will punt a game because he doesn't want to, you know, blow the bullpen for the next couple games or whatever. I think a lot of, you know, fans will, will argue uh, forever about that sort of thing with, with their 
their right. favorite team's manager. But with Dave, you know, that happens and whatever. That's, that's not that big a deal. But, um, you know, just things like putting, uh, announcing to the world that you're going to have in, in 2019, um, game five of the NLDS, there's a very, very public, repeated announcement that Kershaw was going to uh, come in as a reliever at, at yep. some point. And there's, there's, there's just no reason to have all that information whatsoever. Right. Don't prep your hitters to hit Clayton Kershaw. Hit exactly. Kershaw today. Yeah. So there's that. Plus, once Kershaw tied the game or allowed for the game to be tied, he then brought Joe Kelly in for one inning, one inning in which he was great. Joe Kelly's never good enough for the innings. And um, he walked the bases loaded and then gave up a grand slam to Howie Kendrick. And that was the end of 2019. Um, there are decisions in 2018, um, like pulling Rich Hill too early in game four of the World Series um, and how Rich Hill, um, like, it's, it's sort of complicated. I don't want to get too into it, but basically, you know, you have this combination of um, Dave Roberts making a few head scratching decisions plus um, a World Series drought that came despite this incredible postseason run. Right. And just the, the sort of cognitive dissonance of all that. You needed something to blame. Well, here's a, a, a thing that you probably can blame to some degree, um, which did happen, you know, season after season. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, a World Series victory, I think, served as a pretty um, – nice antidote to everyone's anxieties about him. Absolutely. Um, and yeah, I mean, there are some non-David Roberts-esque decisions like leaving Urias in for multiple innings. That's not something he would typically do, just go to a multi-inning reliever for that many innings. But he did it and it worked out. And yeah, I'm not really sure what to say analytically. I, I, I think there's so much about the, the postseason that's just – that really is sort of feel. Yeah. Like all the Absolutely. rules of analytics, like the, the things that, that matter over large samples just disappear, you know? And so you can do things to get that 1% advantage, that 1% advantage, which we will detect over a season, but you don't really see. Doesn't mean <laughs> anything in the postseason. Yeah. It doesn't. So yeah, my, my feeling, sorry, that was a little long winded, but my feeling no, on Dave good. Roberts no. that I, uh, um, I, I think most Dodger fans share is like that. He's so great with, with the players. Um, I hope he could learn from some of his mistakes. And if, if he, you know, does what he had done in 2020, then he'll have a lot of success sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I like your qualifier. <laughs> have a lot it of might success. not work out. Sometimes. <laughs> like you, well, let's say you don't win the World Series. Is it his fault? I don't know. Maybe not. Probably not. Probably because uh, Bellinger's swinging through every pitch up in the zone. You know? <laughs> so I don't know. Baseball's weird. It is weird. It's totally it is weird. weird. Yeah. Um, we have to have our contractually obligated commercial break that I always forget about. So we're going to do that now. How much time do we need? <laughs> None. Do, do, Just, do, do, do. Yeah. Brett dropped do, something do, in. Do, do, oh, do. I was looking forward to the reads. Where one of you no. reads it off, and I get to sit there awkwardly while you're talking about like erectile dysfunction or something. Yeah, it'll be, it'll definitely be something like that, like boner yeah. bills. Sorry for cutting you off, but I was like, oh, I forget about this every time. And then no, I have to you, find some place in it. You did well. Thank you. I can't believe uh, All right, we can resume. Wait, do you want to talk about your juiced balls? <laughs> yeah, we're going to talk about balls next. Okay. You can go now ahead. that we're done talking about ED, let's talk about balls. <laughs> <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, the biggest thing in the baseball news lately has been, um, you know, spin rates, sticky tack, all the fun stuff around what pitchers are and what they're not using, um, which I think is its own scandal that most people saw coming because it's been talked about in many circles for a few years and and kind of 
like the steroid scandal, it was something that everyone knew about, but until it became a, you know, quote, issue, that's when they decided to crack down on it. But the other part I find interesting about this too, that I don't remember coming out of the steroid scandal is that a lot of the players are hitting back saying, hey, Major League Baseball drastically changes the ball year after year how do you expect this game to be consistent when this is happening? And, you know, I, it's something I didn't really think about as being that drastic, but when we start talking about, Oh, Garrett Cole's spin rate dropped X amount between his first starts and in his most recent starts. Yeah. You can make some decisions based on the fact that, you know, it shouldn't drop that much, but I do wonder, is there, any validity to the counter argument of if major league baseball is changing the ball so drastically year over year, could that have just as much impact as whatever substances these guys are using to, to throw uh, baseballs? I mean, I, th I think to give an explicit answer to that question, you'd have to um, do some extremely complex uh, physics and, mm -hmm. um, and statistical analyses. You know, what you're basically asking or what they're saying is that the impacts on run environment, i.e. run value um, from this variable ball is equivalent to the impacts on the run environment of increased spin. And um, I don't know if that's true. It's a difficult, um, analytical question because what are the what does spin really do right like so right. you put spider tack on your hands <laughs> you know or whatever or on their glove and then they mm -hmm. get a little bit on their hands and it makes their hands um grip the ball better and there might be some re residue that's left on the ball too um you get better grip you get increased spin from the release of your hand that spin has like a magnus effect on the ball that imparts movement on it. And so, you know, if you just threw the ball with no spin, the only thing causing it to, to move is like the forward velocity and the gravity pulling it down, right? Right. But if you are spinning it, then you get some, like with the four seam fastball, right? You get some rise mm -hmm. um, because of like the pressure differentials on the ball, it like goes up. And so, you add increased spin and that generally means more movement, right? So you can spin the ball more, it'll, the fastball will rise more, your breaking balls will, will break more and they'll sweep more and all that stuff. But like, what's the run value of all that right. specifically? Like you can speak in general terms and say, um, it makes it harder to hit the ball, which is true, but like how much harder? And that's the, I think the question with the sticky ball, how much is this stuff impacting the game? Um, and I know there's um, some work being done, actually some work in, published on Fangraphs today by Devin Fink, so a, a great follow, um, where he looked at the relationship of spin on different batted ball outcomes. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't have time to read the whole article, it's pretty long. Um, and this is great work. But he looked at like just fastballs and you kind of have to do this for, you know, each, each pitch pitch, yeah. each pitch type. And so, you know, in a, a counterfactual world where there's no grip substance and pitchers are all of a sudden forced to just throw with, um, you know, the friction on their hand, maybe sweat mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, what is the impact on the run environment? And that's just hard to say. Um, because the decrease in spin is gonna cause a de decrease in movement, um, but like globally across all pitchers. That also, so this is the other thing is it makes the relationship between pitches different. It changes the relationship between pitches because you have a certain amount of movement on your fastball, then you have a certain amount of movement on your slider. Right. Now, if the two are different, so the differentials change. And so that makes your fastball worse. It makes your slider worse too. And it's like a synergistic thing. Mm -hmm. So you can't, it can't just like, you might be tempted to just say, well, let's look at the swinging strike rate of pitches, you know, that move some number of inches less 
Um, but that's tough because then does the fastball also move that much less? And right. so that's a long winded way of me saying it's actually an active area of research. Um, and I'm doing some work on this, like this next week okay. <laughs> and trying to make some sort of high level predictions about like, what are the, are the, um, what's the offensive, uh, the offensive environment look like once you decrease movement. And this might like, it's possible that this just is the fix we needed. You don't need to move the base, the, uh, right. the, the mound back, you know, um, you don't need to like ban the shift or whatever. Mm -hmm. This might be the one thing that baseball needs. And I think that's the question I'm most interested in is, is ban is like, um, either banning sticky substances or restricting it to the things that don't have that much of an impact on movement. Like right. rosin, like there's now research on this. Rosin is does or and pine tar do not have the same impact that really sticky stuff does. The sticky, yeah, exactly. And so that's um, to me, you know, maybe a um, a middle area where you're not getting the same degree of, of spin and therefore movement, but you are getting you know, the grip that players are used to or something. Absolutely. Similar. Yeah. I mean, I, it's, it's a topic that's just interesting to me because, you know, I, I think of how badly baseball handled the steroids scandal where it was just like, you know, instead of looking at it being a much bigger issue, they turned the focus onto specific players and, looked at guys like Barry Bonds, who was already a great Hall of Fame player, and then took steroids and just kicked it up another level. And it's much the same to me here, where a lot of the guys that everyone's focused on, whether it's Trevor Bauer, Garrett Cole, some of these other guys, like if they are already good slash elite, like this might be putting it over the top, but to say that this is fundamentally changing the game to such a drastic degree that we're at like some of the lowest offensive production ever. I just, I find that hard to believe that it's that staggering and they're taking this long to fix it. Yeah. I mean, I think you have to have, um, some like okay so right now there's there's like a 24 point something percent strikeout rate on average so it's really high and it's higher than last year but last year we had the universal dh so it's possible that it would have been this high last year um but we just we aren't we don't really know but it, anyway to, to get to your you know point i think you're touching on is really important, which is um, essentially how how do you go about assigning blame? Um, and then, as as a fan, you know what do you care about? Do you like right. if you want to have more hits, more balls in play? Like I'm not sure, you know. I'm not here to say that we definitely want that. Maybe we, we do, we probably do. Most people seem to think we do. I love watching a good strikeout, so I don't know. <laughs> exactly, <laughs> but, yeah, yeah. But like, if that's your, your objective, then yeah, you can't just focus on two players. It's, um, it's really counterproductive to make this a, a, um, a blame game on individuals when the, the problem is that there's a 24, 25% strikeout rate legal wide. Um, if, if that's what you care about, then you have to address the, the systemic issue. Exactly. And there's, I mean, there's re enough reporting now showing that it's not just 20% of, of guys using stuff. It's not 50%. It's, way above that it's like 70 maybe 80 maybe almost everybody exactly we don't really know um but we know it's a lot mm -hmm. um and that would seem to pair 
pretty well with the data on increase in spin. You, are, you do see an increase in velocity and velocity does increase spin to some degree, but it isn't enough to explain the, the spin increase. Right. So I don't know, to my mind, like if your objective is to um, basically make pitchers worse <laughs> so that <laughs> hitters are, you know, being the complement to pitchers will hit better. Um, I think this is, this is the, um, the potentially easiest way of doing it. And, and the problem is that MLB just like could not be managing this worse, you know, right. like I saw somebody <laughs> tweet something earlier. I mean, it's, I, I, I hate being another person who's like, man, MLB sucks. God, MLB sucks. <laughs> We're just so bad at this. This was supposed to be the happy season after COVID, right? Yeah. And of course they have this mid season scandal that they couldn't mm -hmm. just waited to deal with, you know, like why now? I don't know. Yeah. I like, yeah, I, I think it's important, but you could literally have done this before the season. <laughs> you know? Absolutely. Or after, but doing it mid season with kind of inconsistent um, uh, approaches. You know, I don't know. I guess we'll see how they, uh, lay out the punishments and, and everything. But if this is like the Mitchell report, the Mitchell report was such a problem because it, it was a partial list of players that were implicated. And we right. know it was, way, it was yeah. way more big, you know, way more severe. So anyway, I'm rambling on. No, no, no I mean, you make a good point. Yeah, all good points. And it is kind of like interesting to watch it happen again <laughs> it's like didn't you guys learn anything <laughs> nothing at all yeah. it, it's like the same thing all over again i i actually think it's almost worse because i don't remember active and even recently retired players entering this heavily into the conversation the way that they have been around the baseball scandal and yeah. it's just there were questions around it anyway, because the, you know, baseball made that big deal about, you know, redoing the ball last year and did they go too far? And then they were going to correct that. And it's like right in the middle of no one even determining if baseball did a good job of correcting or fixing an issue. Are we now talking about oh, it's, it's the spider tech. This is what's ruining the game. And it's like, are you just looking for things to blame the blame yeah. things? Or do you actually know what the issue is and how to address yeah. it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, to Max's point, like, why didn't you just actually just look into look it, at it and yeah. keep quiet until you <laughs> have yeah. something or nothing? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And oh, I think- Maybe too, collect information. Yeah, maybe. In yeah. the the season. <laughs> and then, and then, do something with it after the season. I don't understand why they're doing something right in the middle of the season. In the right middle now. of the season. Yeah. 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 Um, well, yeah. And then I think it's interesting too, like Pete Alonso coming out and being like, yeah, so <laughs> like, oh, this is not good. <laughs> it's not good for MLB. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I think what, what Pete Alonso said is an understandable perspective. I don't think that MLB has as much control as they um, would appear to have over the manufacturing of the ball. And that's, I mean, this is somewhat of, um, this is what I think, Tommy, what you, you were bringing up, which is that you, you have two co competing forces on the offensive environment. One is the ball itself. The other is the sticky substances used in pitching. And how do you disentangle their impacts? Um, when you were already, you know, wrestling with one difficult question, which is how, what is this new ball like? What is its impact on the game? To then, um, you know, <laughs> sort of strip away the the um, the uh, sticky substances from players potentially in the middle of the season, it, it complicates the understanding of what this new ball, how this new ball behaves. Absolutely. Yeah, I I sh will say that what Pete Alonso suggested um or maybe was explicit about um I, <laughs> he's pretty explicit <laughs> yeah he's pretty explicit he said that they have control direct, over the ball yeah. and that they control <laughs> it for um given the free agency class yeah um and i didn't really follow the thread there the the logic i, I kind of see what he's saying it's sort of like 
boosting up some players and then bringing other players down. Basically um, collusion without directly saying collusion. And, yeah. Um, cause I think, um, Will Middlebrooks even doubled down on, on kind of the same messaging, um, because, you know, MLB owns, you know, Rawlings. So therefore there is some merit to that argument, but yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, it's an understandable one, um, because it f- feels that way and MLB really doesn't do anything to make it not feel that way. Um, but, um, you know, so they, the league assembled a commission um, of multiple baseball obsessed investigators. There was Meredith Wills, um, Alan Nathan, and um, who else was on there? Yeah, anyway, so a number of uh, uh, researchers with different domains of expertise. And one of the things that they, they to me, say by putting that uh, committee together is we actually don't really know. Exactly. Because there's a lot of stuff that goes on inside of, literally stuff that just goes on inside of a baseball. Then there's the, the skin itself. And then there's the, the laces and the tightness of the laces. And, you know, like the where the center of the ball is, is it like, is, it, is the core right perfectly placed in the center? Is it somewhat off put? Um, back, you know, somewhat off center. And if it's somewhat off center, that impacts like how far a ball can travel. And it's like hard to make a good baseball actually. And it's funny, like you see all these, these um, incredible home run, um, you know, like fluctuations season to season. And of course, recently part of it is that there's been an optimization, like a prioritization for players to hit the ball hard and stuff. Um, but historically, like when Babe Ruth hit 60 home runs, like maybe that was just a juice ball, you know, we don't have any, (laughs) we have no way Um, of knowing. Yeah. Yeah. We don't have any that were like recently made. And so there's so much decay that's happened. And so you can't really examine it well. And so, you know, I, I think like there, there's also some degree of variability with, this is really complicated stuff. Barton Smith has talked quite a bit about this. And so Meredith, wells um and um there's there are like specs for the baseball um and then there are very acceptable variances and those little things matter um in the long run and if they're like uniformly distributed and so like you kind of get the exact same you know like you have some variety of balls but they're distributed throughout the season evenly that's fine but sometimes you get like more home runny balls earlier in the season. You get like less home running balls that carry less later in the season, or maybe like um, less home runny, but they're also, they also have more drag. And so they have more movement from pitch from throwing them um, from the spin when you, when they're being thrown. So like, I actually, I, I, my point in all this is like, I think MLB should have a better grip on, so to speak on, the manufacturing of the baseball, but I do appreciate yeah. that it's, it is weirdly more complicated than um, it seems. And um, I'm not sure that they are competent enough to- <laughs> They're not, <laughs> uh, no. <laughs> to, cons- to, to conspire against players with that degree of precision. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and then yeah. how much does like the players union even, how much can they even- stop any of that from happening to not necessarily the balls but like anything else too like yeah it, it's hard to do and you're, you're exactly right max i mean it, it there's a huge difference between lack of transparency which has been an issue with major league baseball for forever and you know competence see to to even do something like that but um there isn't the same level of um rigorous QA on baseballs the way that there is in like golf for golf balls or or some of the other associations where you do have very strict guidelines on what the ball can and can't do and and that's a huge issue my dog just farted (laughs) we're gonna have to edit that out because that sounded like I farted but it was not me (laughs) it didn't sound like a fart it sounded like a cry (laughs) 
I thought, yeah, it, I thought that's what it was. <laughs> no, it was a huge, it was that's a huge great. fart. And it was very like bassy. Oh God. MLB <laughs> farted when they made the baseball. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually had a question kind of follow up to you guys, but that like very much distracted me and made me laugh. Um, <laughs> oh no, it wasn't even a question. It was more of like going along with it, what you guys said. And I am a newer baseball fan, but Tommy and I've even talked about in the past um, sign stealing in particular, and just like compared to other sports, like how many methods of cheating and, or, you know, doctoring perform, whatever you want to call it, um, how much that just affects the whole game and how long it's been going. It's a tradition. I mean, it's just a tradition in baseball yeah. at this point. Um, it seems like it's so deep that it is like, how much will it change the game when they do start doing, well, I guess they have slowly been doing things, but like if they really crack down on all of this, how much would it change the game? Um, and it'll be interesting to see how some of this goes into hall of fame boats in the future. Yeah. Um, that'll be fun. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> we haven't even let any of the steroids guys in yet, you know, that people know about. So, I mean, I don't know what the ramifications will be long term for this. And, and that's that's why I wish that baseball would stop trying to oversimplify the argument, because um, I, I think you laid it out perfectly where there are so many variables and factors to try to definitively say this is impacting the game any more so than any of the other changes that have happened i, I don't know it, it seems like really a futile thing to try to figure out yeah and if, there, if that is panel. just say it yeah you need a panel and i i also think that to some degree you just have to try something new and see how it works and that's what they're doing in the minors um yep. i was i was confounded by the decision to have so many different changes at so many different levels at first and it seemed that if you have you know like a helium player that's really rising through the minors that it would be um, a difficult uh, play environment to navigate but experimenting is important um, and it's you know some of some of the things that, that they are looking at aren't don't seem like that big a deal to me <laughs> I don't know. I, I, I think that it's, it's unfortunate how MLB has not um, given any of us really good reason to think that they will um, competently modify the game to optimize for the things the players want most. Right. But even without the, the faith that they will do this successfully, I am glad that they're trying something. There was some very strong evidence that there are essentially two different baseball constructions last year. Mm -hmm. I don't know this. This is me putting my tinfoil hat on. But to me, that screams experiment. Yeah. You have one condition, one treatment condition, and another treatment condition. What are the effects on the game? And we don't know which balls were where exactly. There's some evidence that like Dodger Stadium had the more deadened ball and then in Atlanta, they had the more lively ball, um, but it's not definitive. And so what I think, um, I think will have to uh, happen is that there's additional transparency in the experimentation process itself um, and what their findings are. And ultimately what, um, what options they have on the table, you know, in terms of uh, like banning the shift or in terms of, um, you know, moving them the mound back or getting rid of sticky substances or whatever. And yeah, I, I don't like, I don't have confidence that they'll do this right, <laughs> but at least it seems like there's some gears turning, you know, absolutely. And that's a, a positive sign. Yeah. So with that, um, I want to thank you again for being our guest. It's been awesome having you on um, and really looking forward to uh, seeing more of your work, especially getting into some of the research that you were talking about with um, all that's going on with these crazy, crazy balls. Crazy yeah, balls. Hopefully this next week we'll have some crazy ball, <laughs> some crazy ball research, Cra crazy spinning ball 
<laughs> exactly. So well, thank, thank you so much you. again. Yeah, thanks, and, Max. Um, Come back will, anytime. Yeah, we will be happy to have you back. Um, I know there's going to be more stuff to talk about as the season progresses. Uh, anytime. This was fun. Awesome. All right. All right. Well, Keelan, it's been a pleasure. Let's we'll do it again sometime. Yes. All, All right. right. Bye. Bye. Bye.